Donkey Deli. It's just, maybe it's not there anymore. It's, um, it is Spanish German food. Yeah, Donkey Deli. It's, maybe, maybe it's interesting. Welcome to another wonderful performance of the Willing Suspension Armchair Theater and another great event for our celebration of Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. This is one of 30 events that we've been doing to celebrate Steinbeck and the times of Steinbeck, the photography that went on during that time period, and the history of that time period. Uh, these events are put together by a partnership called Santa Cruz Reads. Santa Cruz Reads is a collaboration of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries, the Friends of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries, and Santa Cruz Writes. And we believe that great works of literature inspire conversations, and that certainly has been true so far this month. We see that that is definitely true. I do want to point out, you probably already noticed, that one of our important partners, the Community TV, is here tonight. So this performance is being filmed, and you will get to see it on, on your local uh, Community TV station. We're very pleased about that, and they have filmed several of our events, and there's a few more uh, yet to go. I'd like to introduce Wilma Marcus Chandler, who's going to set the stage for tonight's performance, and we'll kind of let everybody settle in a little bit, and then when everybody's got a good spot, we'll begin. <coughs> Wilma? Okay. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here on behalf of the Willing Suspension Armchair Theater. We are a reader's theater company dedicated to bringing literature to the public in live performances. We have a, a cadre of about 100 readers and about 20 directors. And we do shows on many different topics throughout the year at libraries and bookstores and theaters and anywhere else that people would like to hear stories, fiction, uh, poetry, not drama, fiction, poetry, oral histories, letters, and things on many, many different topics. We're very honored to be part of the Big Read, the Steinbeck Read, and I would like to introduce our readers who are going to be reading Steinbeck's odd chapters, the alternate chapters, the counterpoint, contrapuntal chapters to the actual story of the Grapes of Wrath. These are the alternate chapters which really talk about America, ecology, and the spiritual quest of the book. Um, we have Nick Billardello, Dave Kramer Erner, John Chandler, Deborah Bryant, Mauricio Samano, Ruthie Elliott. Oh! <laughs> Avondine. <laughs> you can only hold six names at time. Avondine Wills and Karen Schomburg. Thank you and enjoy the show. <laughs> From a 1938 letter, my whole work drive has been aimed at making people understand each other. To his close friend Pascal Covici, I'm not writing a satisfying story. I've done my damnedest to rip a reader's nerves to rags. I've tried to make the reader participate in the actuality. What he takes from it will be scaled entirely on his own depth or hollowness. There are five layers in the book, and a reader will find as many as he can, and he won't find more than he has in himself. And those five layers are, one, a family struggle, two, a people struggle, the migrant struggle, three, the story of a nation, America, four, a spiritual journey, the quest for profound understanding of mankind's commitment to his fellow man and to the earth we inhabit. And five, a study in ecology, the environmental shifts and the awareness required to save the land. And now from the Grapes of Wrath. Chapter one. To the red country and part of the gray country of Oklahoma, the last rains came gently and they did not cut the scarred earth. The plows crossed and recrossed the rivulet marks, 
the surface of the earth crusted, a thin, hard crust. And as the sky became pale, so the earth became pale. Pink in the red country and white in the gray country. In the water-cut gullies, the earth dusted down in dry little streams. Gophers and antlions started mall avalanches. And as the harp sun struck, day after day, the leaves of the young corn became less stiff and erect. They bent in a curve, and then, as the central ribs grew weak, each leaf tilted downward. The air was thin and the sky more pale. And every day, the earth paled. When June was half gone, the big clouds moved up out of Texas and the Gulf high, heavy clouds, rain heads. The men in the fields looked up at the clouds and sniffed and held wet fingers up to the scents to sense the wind. And the horses were nervous while the clouds were up. The rain heads dropped a little spattering and hurried on to some other country. In the dust were dropped craters where the rain had fallen and clean splashes on the corn. And that was all. The wind grew stronger. The air and sky darkened, and through them the sun shone redly, and there was a raw sting in the air. During the night, the wind raced faster over the land, dug cunningly among the rootlets of the corn, and the corn fought the wind with weakened leaves. <laughs> the dawn came, but no day. In the gray sky, a red sun appeared, a dim red circle, that gave a little light like dusk. And as the day advanced, the dusk slipped back toward darkness, and the wind cried and whimpered over the fallen corn. <coughs> Men and women huddled in their homes and tied handkerchiefs over their noses when they went out and wore goggles to protect their eyes. When night came, it was black night, for the stars could not pierce the dust. The wind passed and left the land quiet. The people lying in their beds heard the wind stop. They lay quietly and listened deep into the stillness. <clears throat> in the morning, the dust lay like fog, and the sun was red as ripe new blood. All day, the dust sifted down from the sky, and the next day, it sifted down. An even blanket covered the earth, it settled on the corn, piled up on the fence posts, on the wires, on the roofs, blanketed the weeds and the trees. The people came out of their houses and smelled the hot, stinging air and covered their noses from it. The children came out of the houses, but they did not run or shout as they would after a rain. Men stood by the fences and looked at the ruined corn. The men were silent and they did not move often. And the women came out of the houses to stand by their men, to feel whether this time the men would break. After a while, the faces of the men lost their perplexity and became hard and angry and resistant. Then the women knew they were safe and that there was no break. Then they asked, what'll we do? And the men replied, I don't know, but it was all right. The women and children knew deep in themselves that no misfortune was too great to bear if their men were whole. <clears throat> and the men sat in the doorways of their houses. Their hands were busy with sticks and little rocks. The men sat still, thinking, figuring. Chapter three. The turtle. The concrete highway was edged with a mat of tangled, broken, dry grass, and the grass heads were heavy with oat beards to catch on a dog's coat, and foxtails to tangle in a horse's fetlocks, and clover birds to fasten in sheep's wool. Sleeping life waiting to be spread and dispersed. Every seed armed with an appliance of dispersal, twisting darts and parachutes for the wind little spears and balls of tiny thorns, and all waiting for animals, or the hem of a woman's skirt, 
all passive, but armed with appliances of activity, still, but each possessed of the unlaga of movement. The sun lay on the grass and warmed it, and in the shade under the grass, the insects moved. Ants and ant lions to set traps for them, and grasshoppers to jump into the air and flick their yellow wings for a second. <clears throat> Sow bugs like little armadillos, plodding recklessly on many tender feet. And over the grass at the roadside, a land turtle crawled, turning aside for nothing, dragging his high dome shell over the grass. His hard legs and yellow nailed feet thresh slowly through the grass, not really walking, but boosting and dragging his shell along. The barley beard slid off his shell and the clover burrs fell on him and rolled to the ground. His horny beak was partly opened and his fierce, humorous eyes, under brows like fingernails, stared straight ahead. He came over the grass, leaving a beaten trail behind him, and the hill, which was the highway embankment, reared up ahead of him. For a moment he stopped, his head held high. He blinked and looked up and down. At last he started to climb the embankment. Front clawed feet reached forward but did not touch. The hind feet kicked his shell along, and it scraped on the grass and on the gravel. As the embankment grew steeper and steeper, the more frantic were the efforts of the land turtle, pushing hind legs, strained and slipped, boosting the shell along, and the horny head protruded as far as the neck could stretch. Little by little, the shell slid up the embankment until at last a parapet cut straight across its line of march, the shoulder of the road, a concrete wall four inches high. As though they worked independently, the hind legs pushed the shell against the wall. The head upraised and peered over the wall to the broad, smooth plain of cement. Now the hands, braced on top of the wall, strained and lifted, and the shell came slowly up and rested its front end on the wall. For a moment, the turtle rested. A red ant ran into the shell, into the soft skin inside the shell. And suddenly head and legs snapped in and the armored tail clamped in sideways. The red ant was crushed between body and legs. And one head of wild oats was clamped into the shell by a front leg. For a long moment, the turtle lay still. And then the neck crept out and the old humorous frowning eyes looked about and the legs and tail came out. The back legs went to work, straining like elephant legs, and the shell tipped to an angle so that the front legs could not reach the level cement plain. But higher and higher, the hind legs boosted itself until at last the center of balance was reached. Now the going was easy, and all the legs worked and the shell boosted along, waggling from side to side. The sedan driven by a 40-year-old woman approached. She saw the turtle and swung to the right off the highway. The wheels screamed and a cloud of dust boiled up. Two wheels lifted for a moment and then settled. The car skidded back onto the road and went on, but more slowly. The turtle had jerked into its shell, but now it hurried on, for the highway was burning hot. And now a light truck approached, and as it came near, the driver saw the turtle and swerved to hit it. His front wheel struck the edge of the shell, flipped the turtle like a tiddlywink, spun it like a coin, and rolled it off the highway. The truck went back to its course along the right side. Lying on its back, the turtle was tight in its shell for a long time. But at last, its legs waved in the air, reaching for something to pull it over. Its front its front foot caught a piece of quartz, and little by little, the shell pulled over and flopped upright. The wild old head fell out, and three of the spearhead seeds stuck in the ground. And as the turtle crawled down the embankment, its shell dragged dirt over the seeds. The turtle entered a dust road and jerked itself along, 
drawing a wavy, shallow trench in the dust with its shell. The old humorous eyes looked ahead and the horny beak opened a little. His yellow toenail slipped a fraction in the dust. Chapter five. The owners of the land came onto the land, or more often, a spokesman for the owners came. They came in closed cars and they felt the dry earth with their fingers. And sometimes they drove big earth augers into the ground for soil tests. The tenants watched from their sun-beaten dooryards, watched uneasily when the closed cars drove along the fields. And at last, the owner men drove into the dooryards and sat in their cars to talk out of their windows. The tenant men stood beside the cars for a while and then squatted on their hams and found <laughs> sticks with which to mark the dust. Some of the owner men were kind because they hated what they had to do. And some of them were angry because they hated to be cruel. And some of them were cold because they had long ago found that one could not be an owner unless they were cold. And all of them were caught in something larger than themselves. Some of them hated the mathematics that drove them. And some were afraid. And some worshiped the mathematics because it provided a refuge from thought and feeling. If a bank or a finance company owned the land, the owner man said, the bank or the company needs, wants, insists, must have, as though the bank or company were a monster with thought and feeling and which had ensnared them. They were men and slaves, while the banks were machines and masters. Some of the owner men were proud to be slaves to such cold and powerful masters. You know the land is poor, You've scrabbled at it long enough. God knows, you know the land's getting poorer, poorer. You know what cotton does to the land, robs it, sucks all the blood out of it. Well, it's too late. And the owner man explained the workings and thinkings of the monster that was stronger than they were. A man can hold land if he can just eat and pay taxes. He can do that until his crops fail and he has to borrow money from the bank. But you see, a bank or a company can't do that because those creatures don't breathe air, don't eat side meat. They breathe profits. They eat the interest on money. If they don't get it, they die the way you die, without air, without side meat. It is a sad thing, but it is so. The squatting men look down again. What do you want us to do? We can't take less share of the crop. We're half starved now. The kids are hungry all the time. We got no clothes, torn and ragged. If all the neighbors weren't the same, we'd ashamed to go to meeting. And at last, the owner men came to the point. The tenant system won't work anymore. One man on a tractor can take the place of 12 or 14 families. But you'll kill the land with cotton. We know we've got to take the cotton quick before the land dies. Then we'll sell the land. Lots of families in the East would like to own a piece of land. You'll have to get off the land. The plows will go through the dooryard. It's not us. It's the monster. Men made it, but they can't control it. But if we go, where'll we go? How'll we go? We got no money. Well, maybe you can go on relief. Why don't you go on west to California? There's work there and it never gets cold. Why, you can reach up anywhere and pick an orange. Why don't you go there? And the owner men started their cars and rolled away. Where will we go, the women asked. We don't know. We don't know. The tractors came over the roads and into the fields. Great crawlers moving like insects, having the incredible strength of insects. They ignored hills and gulches, water courses, fences, houses. <coughs> the man sitting in the iron seat did not look like a man. Gloved, goggled, rubber dust mask. He was part of the monster, a robot in the seat. He could not see the land as it was. He could not smell the land as it was. His feet did not stamp the clods or feel the warmth and power of the earth. At noon, the driver stopped near a tenant house and opened his lunch. Sandwiches wrapped in wax paper white bread, pickled cheese, spam, a piece of pie branded like an engine part. Curious children crowded close. 
ragged children who ate their fried dough as they watched. They watched hungrily the unwrapping of the sandwiches. They didn't speak to the driver. They watched his hand as it carried food to his mouth. After a while, a tenant who could not leave the place came out and squatted in the shade beside the tractor. Why, you Joe Davis's boy? Sure. Well, what are you doing this kind of work for? Against your own people? Three dollars a day. I got damn sick of creeping for my dinner and not getting it. Now, I got a wife and kids. We got to eat. Three dollars a day. And it comes in every day. That's right, but for your three dollars a day, 15 or 20 families can't eat at all. You can't think of that. I got to think of my own kids. It's not me. I'll lose my job if I don't do it. And look, suppose you kill me. They'll just hang you. But long before you're hung, they'll get another guy on the tractor and he'll bump the house down. You're not gonna be killing the right guy. Thought so. Who gave the orders? I'll go after him. He's the one to kill. You're wrong. He got his orders from the bank. Bank gets orders from the East. Where does it stop? Who can we shoot? I don't aim to starve you to death before I kill the man who's starving me. I don't know. Maybe there's no one to shoot. Maybe it isn't men at all. Maybe the property's doing it. Anyway, I told you my orders. The tractor cut a straight line on, and the air and the ground vibrated with its thunder. Chapter 9. In the little houses, the tenant people sifted their belongings and the belongings of their fathers and, and their grandfathers, picked over their possessions for the journey west. <clears throat> the men were ruthless because the past had been spoiled, but the women knew how the past would cry to them in the coming days. The men went into the barns and sheds, harness, carts, cedars, little bundles of hose. <clears throat> Bring them out, pile them up, load them in the wagon, take them to the town, sell them for what you can get. Sell the team and the wagon. No more use for anything. 15 cents isn't enough to get for a good plow. That cedar costs $38. $2 isn't enough. Can't haul it all back. Well, take it and a bitterness with it. Junk piled up in the yard. We'll take it. All junk and give me $5. You're not only buying junk, you're buying junked lives. Buying bitterness. And the tenant man came walking back, hands in their pockets, hats pulled down. Some bought a pint and drank it too fast to make the impact hard and stunning. But they didn't laugh and they didn't, they didn't dance. They didn't sing or pick guitars. They walked back to the farms, hands in their pockets and heads down, shoes kicking the red dust up. Maybe we can start again in the new rich land in California, where the fruit grows. We'll start over. But you can't start. Only a baby can start. You and me, why, we're all that's been. The anger of the moment, the thousands of pictures, that's us. This land, this red land is us. And the flood years and the dust years and the drought years are us. The bitterness we sold to the junk man, he got it all right, but we have it still. And when the owner man told us to go, that's us. And when the tractor hit the house, that's us until we're dead. To California or any place, everyone a drum major leading a parade of hurts. And someday, the armies of bitterness will all be go going the same way. And they'll all walk together. And there will be a dead terror from it. How can we live without our lives? How will we know it's us without our past? No, leave it, burn it. How would it be not to know what lands outside the door? Suddenly they were, they were nervous. Gotta get out quick now. Can't wait. We can't wait. And they piled up the goods in the yards and set fire to them. They stood and watched them burning, and then frantically, they loaded up the cars and drove away. 
drove in the dust. The dust hung in the air for a long time after the loaded cars had passed. Chapter 12. <coughs> Highway 66 is the main migrant road. 66, the long concrete path across the country, waving gently up and down on the map from Mississippi to Bakersfield, <coughs> over the red lands and the gray lands, twisting up into the mountains, crossing the divide and down into the bright and terrible desert, and across the desert to the mountains again, <coughs> and into the rich California valleys. <coughs> 66 is the path of a people in flight. They come into 66 from the tributary side roads, from the wagon tracks and the rutted country roads. 66 is the mother road, the road of flight. Clarksville and Ozark and Van Buren and Fort Smith on 64. And there's an end of Arkansas. And all the roads into Oklahoma City, 66 down from Tulsa, 270 up from McAllister, 81 from Wichita Falls South, from Enid North, Edmund, McLeod, Purcell. 66 out of Oklahoma City. El Reno and Clinton going west on 66. Hydro, Elk City, and Texola. And there's an end to Oklahoma. 66 across the panhandle of Texas. Shamrock and McLean, Conway and Amarillo, the yellow. <clears throat> Will Dorado and Vega and Boyce, and there's an end of Texas. To come carry and Santa Rosa and into the New Mexican mountains to Albuquerque, where the road comes down from Santa Fe. Then down the gorge, Rio Grande to Los Lunas, and west again on 66 to Gallup, and there's the border of New Mexico. And now the high mountains, Holbrook and Winslow and Flagstaff and the high mountains of Arizona. Then the Great Plateau rolling like a groundswell, Ash Fork and Kingman, and Stone Mountains again, where water must be hauled and sold. Then out of the broken, sun-rotted mountains of Arizona to the Colorado with green reeds on its banks. And that's the end of Arizona. There is California just over the river, and a pretty town to start it up. Needles <laughs> on the river. <laughs> But the river is a stranger in this place. Up from Needles and over the Burn Range, and there's the desert. The 66 goes on over the terrible desert, where the distance shimmers, and the Black Center Mountains hang unbearably in the distance. At last, there's Barstow, and more desert, until the last of the mountains rise up again. The good mountains, and 66 winds through them. Then suddenly a pass, and below the beautiful valley, below orchards and vineyards and little houses, and in the distance, a city. And oh my God, it's over. Listen to the motor. Listen to the wheels. Listen with your ears and with your hands on the steering wheel. Listen with the palm of your hand on the gear shift lever. Listen with your feet on the floorboards. Listen to the pounding old jalopy with all your senses. For a change of tone, a variation of rhythm may mean a week here. That rattle, that's tappets, don't hurt a bit. Tappets can rattle till Jesus comes Ooh. again without no harm. But that thudding as the car moves along, can't hear that, just kind of feel it. Maybe oil isn't getting someplace. Maybe a baron's starting to go. Jesus, if it's a baron, what'll we do? Money's going fast. And why's the son of a bitch heat up so hot today? This ain't no climb. Let's look. God almighty, the fan belt's gone. Here, make a belt out of this little piece of rope. Let's see how long. There, I'll splice the ends. Now take her slow, slow till we can get to a town. That rope belt won't last long. Tires. Two layers of fabric worn through. Only a four-ply tire might get a hundred miles more out of her if we don't hit a rock and blow her. Which will we take? A hundred, maybe, miles? Or maybe spoil the tube. Which? A hundred miles. Well, that's something you got to think about. We got tube patches. Maybe when she goes, she'll only spring a leak. How about making a boot? Might get 500 more miles. Let's go on till she blows. Gotta get a tire, but Jesus, they want a lot for a whole tire. 
They look a fella over. They know he got to go on. They know he can't wait. And the price goes up. Take it or leave it. I ain't in business for my health. I'm here with selling tires. I ain't giving them away. I can't help what happens to you. I got to think what happens to me. How far is the next town? I seen 42 cars of you fellas go by yesterday. Where you all come from? Where are all of you going? This is a free country. Fella can go where he wants. <clears throat> That's what you think. Ever hear of the Border Patrol on the California line? <coughs> Police from Los Angeles stopped you bastards, turns you back, says, if you can't buy no real estate, we don't want you. Says, got a driver's license? Let's see it. Tore it up. Says you can't come in without no driver's license. It's a, it's a free country. Well, try to get some freedom to do. Fella says you're just as free as you got Jack to pay for it. In California, they got high wages. I got a handbill here. Talks about it. Bull. Bull. Love me. I seen folks coming back. Somebody's kidding you. You want that tire or don't you? Got to take it, but Jesus, mister, it cuts into our money. We ain't got much left. Well, I ain't no charity. Take her along. Got to, I guess. Let's look her over. Open her up. Look at the casing. You son of a bitch. You said the casing was good. She's damn near broke through. The hell she is. Well, by George. How come I didn't see that? <laughs> you did see it, you son of a bitch. You want to charge us four bucks for a busted casing? I'd like to take a sock at you. Now keep your shirt on. I didn't see it, I tell you. Here, tell you what I'll do. I'll give you this one for three fifty. <laughs> You'll take a flying jump at the moon. We'll try to make it to the next town. Think we can make it on that tire? Got to. I'll go on the rim before I'd give that son of a bitch a dime. Danny in the back seat wants a cup of water. After we got no water here. Listen, at the rear end? Can't tell. Sound telegraphs through the frame. There goes a gasket. Got to go on. Listen to her whistle. Find a nice place to camp and I'll jerk the head off. But God almighty, the food's getting low. The money's getting low. When we can't buy no more gas, what then? Danny in the back seat wants a cup of water. Little fellow's thirsty. Listen to that <laughs> gasket whistle. She rides there, she went. Blowed tube and casing all to hell. Have to fix her. Save that casing to make boots. Cut them out and stick them inside a weak place. 250,000 people over the road. 50,000 old cars, wounded, streaming. Wrecks along the road, abandoned. Well, what happened to them? What happened to the folks in that car? Did they walk? Where are they? Where does the courage come from? Where does the terrible faith come from? And here's a story you can hardly believe, but it's true, and it's funny, and it's beautiful. There was a family of 12, and they were forced off the land. They had no car. They built a trailer out of junk and loaded it with their possessions. They pulled it to the side of 66 and waited. And pretty soon, a sedan picked them up. Five of them rode in the sedan and seven on the trailer and, on a, and a dog on the trailer. They got to California in two jumps. The man who pulled them fed them, and that's true. But how can such courage be and such <coughs> faith in their own species? Very few things would teach such faith. The people in flight from the terror behind, strange things happen to them, some bitterly cruel and some so beautiful that the faith is refired forever. Chapter 14. The Western Land, nervous under the beginning change. The Western Land, nervous as horses before a thunderstorm. The great owner sensing a change, knowing nothing of the nature of a change. The great owners striking at the immediate thing, the widening government, the growing labor unity, striking at new taxes, at plans, not knowing these things are results, not causes. There is little difference between a tractor and a tank. People are driven, intimidated, hurt by both. We must think about this. I lost my land. A single tractor took my land. I am alone, 
and I am bewildered. And in the night, one family camps in a ditch and another family pulls in and the tents come out. The two men squat on their hams and the women and children listen. Here's the node, you who hate change and fear revolution. Keep these two squatting men apart. Make them hate, fear, suspect each other. Here's the unlaga of the thing you fear. This is the zygote. For here, I lost my land is changed as cell is split and from its splitting grows the thing you hate. We lost our land. The danger is here for two men are not as lonely and perplexed as one. And from this first we, there grows a still more dangerous thing. I have a little food, plus I have none. If from this problem the sum is, we have a little food, the thing is on its way. The movement has direction. Only a, a little multipli multipli multiplication now, and this land, this tractor, is ours. The two men squatting in a ditch, the little fire, the side meat stewing in a single pot, the silent, stone-eyed women behind the children, listening with their souls to words their minds do not understand. The night draws down. The baby has a cold. Here, take this blanket, it's wool. It was my mother's blanket. Take it for the baby. This is the thing to bomb. This is the beginning from I to we. If you who own the things people must have could understand this, you might preserve yourself. If you could separate causes from results, if you could know that pain, Marx, Jefferson, Lenin were results, not causes, you might survive. But that you cannot know. For the quality of owning freezes you forever into I and cuts you off forever from the we. The Western states are nervous under the beginning change. Need is the stimulus to concept, concept to action. A half million people moving over the country. A million more restive, ready to move. 10 million more feeling the first nervousness. And tractors <clears throat> turning the multiple furrows in the vacant land. Chapter 15. Along 66, the hamburger stands. Al and Susie's place. Carl's lunch. Joe and Minnie. Will's eats. Board and bat shacks. Two gasoline pumps in front, a screen door, a long bar, stools, and a foot rail. Near the door, three slot machines showing through the glass the wealth of nickels three bars will bring. And beside them, the nickel phonograph with records piled up like pies, ready to swing out to the turntable and play dance music. Tippy tippy tin. Thanks for the memory. Bing Crosby, Benny Goodman. Down at one end, the cooking plates. Pots of stew, potatoes, pot roast, roast beef, gray roast pork waiting to be sliced. The cook is Joe, or Carl, or Al. May is the contact. Smiling irritated, near to outbreak. Smiling while her eyes look on past. Unless for truck drivers. They're the backbone of the joint. Can't fool truck drivers. They know. They bring custom. They know. The big cars on the highway, languid, heat-rattled ladies, small nucleuses about whom revolve a thousand accoutrements, creams, ointments to grease themselves, coloring matter in vials, black, pink, red, white, green, silver. Beside them, little pot-bellied men in light suits and Panama hats with worried eyes, restless eyes, worried because Formulas don't work out, hungry for security, and yet sensing its disappearance from the earth. In their lapels, the insignia of lodges and service clubs, places where they can go, 
and by a weight of numbers of little worried men reassure themselves that business is noble and not the curious ritualized thievery they know it is, that businessmen are intelligent in spite of the records of their stupidity, that they are kind and charitable in spite of the principles of sound business. And these two, going to California to sit in the lobby of the Beverly Wilshire Hotel and watch people they envy go by, to look at mountains, mountains, mind you, and great trees, he with his worried eyes, and she thinking how the sun will dry her skin, cruising along at 60. I want a cold drink. Well, there's something up ahead. Want to stop? Do you think it's clean? Uh, clean as you're going to find in this godforsaken country. The great car squeals and pulls to a stop. The fat, worried man helps his wife out. May looks at and pass them as they enter. Al looks up from his griddle and down again. May knows. They'll drink a five-cent soda and crab that it ain't cold enough. The woman will use six paper napkins and drop them on the floor. The man will choke and put the blame on May. The woman will sniff as though she smelled rotting meat, and they will go out again and tell forever afterward that the people of the West are sullen. And May, when she is alone with Al, has a name for them. She calls them shit heels. <laughs> Truck drivers, that's the stuff. A 1926 Nash sedan pulled wearily off the highway. The back seat was piled nearly to the ceiling with sacks, with pots and pans. And on the very top, right near the ceiling, two boys rode. The car pulled up to the gas pumps. A dark-haired, hatchet-faced man got slowly out. And the two boys slid down from the load and hit the ground. May walked around the counter and stood at the door. The man asked, can we get some water, ma'am? Sure, go ahead. I'll keep my eye on the hose. She watched while the man unscrewed the, the radiator cap and ran the hose in. A woman in the car said, See if you can't get it here. The man turned off the hose and screwed on the cap again. The little boys took the hose from him and they upended it and drank thirstily. The man took off his hat and stood with a curious humility in front of the screen. Did you see your way to sell us a loaf of bread, ma'am? This ain't no grocery store. We got bread to make sandwiches. If we sell bread, we're gonna run out. We're hungry. <clears throat> Why don't you buy a sandwich? We got nice sandwiches, hamburgs. We can't. We gotta make a dime to all of us. You can't get no loaf of bread for a dime. We only got 15 cent loaves. Got a mighty maid, give him bread. We'll run out before the brack drug comes. Well, run out then, goddammit. This here a 15 cent loaf. God damn it, mate, give him the loaf. No, we want to buy 10 cents worth of it. We got to figure out for clothes, mister, to get to California. You can have this for 10 cents. That'd be robbing you, ma'am. Go ahead, Al says take it. May sound funny to be so tight, but we got a thousand miles to go and we don't know if we'll make it. When he put his dime on the counter, he had a penny with it. He was about to put it back in his pouch when his eye fell on the boys, frozen behind the candy counter. <laughs> Is them penny candy, ma'am? Oh, them? Well, no. Them's two for a penny. Well, give me two then, ma'am. He placed a copper cent carefully on the counter. The boys expelled their breath softly. May held the big sticks out. Take them. <laughs> they reached timidly. Each took a stick and they held them down at their sides and did not look at them. But they looked at each other and their mouth corners smiled rigidly with embarrassment. Thank you, ma'am. The man picked up the bread and went out the door and the little boys marched stiffly behind him, the red striped sticks held tightly against their legs. They leaped like chipmunks over the front seat and onto the top of the load and they burrowed back out of sight like chipmunks. The man got in and started his car, and with a roaring motor and a cloud of blue, oily smoke, the ancient Nash climbed up on the highway and went on its way to the west. From inside the restaurant, the truck drivers and May and Al stared after them. Big Bill wheeled back. Them wasn't two for a cent candy. What's that to you? 
It was nickel apiece candy. We gotta get going. We're dropping time. They reached in their pockets. Bill put a coin on the counter, and the other man looked at it and reached again and put down a coin. They swung around and walked to the door. So long. Hey, wait a minute. You got change. You go to hell. And the screen door slammed. May watched them get into the great truck, watch it lumber off in low gear, and heard the shift up the winding gears to the cruising ratio. Al? He looked up from the hamburger he was patting thin and stacking between wax papers. What you want? Look there. She pointed at the coins beside the cups. Two half dollars. Al walked near and looked, and then he went back to his work. Truck drivers. And after them, shit heels. <laughs> <coughs> Chapter 17. The cars of the migrant people crawled out the side roads onto the great cross-country highway and then took the migrant way to the west. In the daylight, they scuttled like bugs to the westward. And as the dark caught them, they clustered like bugs, near to shelter and to water. And because they were lonely and perplexed, because they had all come from a place of sadness and worry and defeat, and because they were all going to a new, mysterious place, they huddled together, they talked together, they shared their lives, their food, and the things they hoped for in the new country. Thus it might be that one family camped by a spring, and another camped for the spring and the company, and a third because two families had pioneered the place and found it good. And when the sun went down, perhaps 20 families and 20 cars were there. In the evening, sitting about the fires, the 20 were one. The families learned what rights must be observed, the right of privacy in the tent, the right to keep the past black hidden in the heart, the right to talk and to listen, the right to refuse help or accept it, to offer help or decline it, the right of a son to court or a daughter to be courted, the right of the hungry to be fed, the rights of the pregnant and the sick to transcend all other rights. The families learned what rights are monstrous and must be destroyed, the right to intrude upon privacy, the right to be noisy while the camp slept, the right of seduction or rape, adultery, theft, murder. These rights were crushed because the little worlds could not exist for even a night with such rights alive. They grew up governments and leaders with elders, and the world were built in the evening. The people moving in from the highways made them with their tents and their hearts and their brains. The camps became fixed, each a short day's journey from the last. Time to look for a place to stop, and there's some tents ahead. The car pulled off the road and stopped, and because others were there first, certain courtesies were necessary. Can we pull up and sleep? Why, sure. Be proud to have you. What state you from? Come all the way from Arkansas. These Arkansas people down that fourth tent. That's so. And the great question. How's the water? Well, she don't taste so good, but there's plenty. Well, thank you. When the sun rose, the camping place was vacant, and it was ready for a new world in a new night. But along the highway, the cars of the migrant people crawled out like bugs, and the narrow concrete miles stretched ahead. Chapter 21. These goddamn Okies are dirty and ignorant. They're degenerate, sexual maniacs, thieves. They'll steal anything. They got no sense of property rights. And the latter was true, for how can a man without property know the ache of ownership? The local people whipped themselves into a mold of cruelty then they formed units, squads, and armed them. Armed them with clubs, with gas, with guns. We own the country. We can't let these Okies get out of hand. And the men who were armed did not own the land, but they thought they did. And the clerks who drilled at night owned nothing, and the little storekeepers possessed only a drawer full of debts. But even a debt is something. Even a job is something. The clerk thought, I get $15 a week. Suppose a goddamn Okie would work for 12. And the little storekeeper thought, how can I compete with a debtless man? <clears throat> when
When there was work for a man, ten fought for it, fought with a low wage. If that fellow will work for 30 cents, I'll work for 25. If he'll take 25, I'll do it for 20. No, me, I'm hungry. I'll work for 15, I'll work for food. And this was good. For wages went down and prices stayed up. Then a new method. A great owner bought a cannery. And when the peaches and the pears were ripe, he cut the price of the fruit below the cost of raising it. And the cannery owner paid himself a low price for the fruit and kept the price of canned goods up and took his profit. As time went on, there were fewer farms. And the farmers moved into town for a while and exhausted their credit, exhausted their friends, their relatives. And they too went on the highways. And the roads were crowded with men ravenous for work, ravenous, murderous for work. The fields were fruitful, and starving men moved <coughs> on the roads. Chapter 23. A harmonica is easy to carry. <clears throat> Take it out of your hip pocket, knock it against your palm to shake out the dirt and pocket fuzz and bits of tobacco. Now it's ready. You can do anything with a harmonica thin, reedy single tone or chords, or melody with rhythm chords. You can mold music with curved hands, making it wail and cry like bagpipes, making it full and round like an organ, making it sharp and bitter as the reed pipes of the hills. And you can play it and put it back in your pocket. And as you play, you learn new tricks, new way to mold the tone with your hands, to pinch the tone with your lips, and no one teaches you. And if you lose it or break it, you can buy another one for a quarter. A guitar is more precious. Must learn this thing. Fingers of the left hand must have callous caps. Thumb of the right hand, a horn of callous. Player in the evening, and they use a harmonica player in the next tent. Makes it pretty nice together. <clears throat> the fiddle is rare, hard to learn, no frets, no teacher. Let's listen to an old man try to pick it up. Shrill is the wind, the fiddle, quick and nervous and shrill. These three in the evening, harmonica, fiddle, and guitar, playing a reel and tapping out the tune and the big deep strings beating like a heart. And people move close. Look at that Texas boy. Long legs loose, taps four times for every damn step. Never seen a boy swing around like that. Look at him swing that Cherokee go, redden her lips and her toes point out. Look at her pant, look at her heave. Think she's tired, think she's winded, well she ain't. Texas boy got his hair in his eyes, mouth wide open and can't get air, but he pats four times for every darn step and he keeps it going with the Cherokee girl. <laughs> Old folks stand to patting their hands, smiling and tapping their feet. Chapter 25. The spring is beautiful in California. Valleys in which the fruit blossoms are fragrant pink and white waters in a shallow sea. The first tendrils of grapes swelling from the old gnarled vines and on the level vegetable lands are the mile long rows of pale green lettuce, the spindly cauliflowers, the gray green unearthly artichoke plants. Behind the fruitfulness are men of understanding who experiment with seed, endlessly developing techniques for greater crop, crops of plants whose roots will resist the millions of enemies of the earth, molds, insects, rusts, and blights. And there are men of chemistry who spray the trees against pests, who sulfur the grapes, who cut out diseases and rots. Men who graft the young trees, the little vines, are the cleverest of all. For theirs is a surgeon's job. To place the grafts, to bind the wounds, and to cover them from the air, these are great men. First the cherries ripen, set in a half a pound. Hell, we can't pick them for that. Black cherries, red cherries, and birds eat half of each, and the yellow jackets buzz into the holes the birds made. The purple prunes soften and sweeten. My God, we can't pick them and dry and sulfur them. And the purple prunes carpet the ground, and the pears grow yellow and soft. 
The yellow jackets dig into the soft meat, and there is a smell of ferment and rot. Then the grapes. We can't make good wine. People can't buy good wine. Rip the grapes from the vines. Good grapes, rotten grapes. Wasp stung grapes. Press stems, press dirt and rot. Oh well, it has alcohol in it anyway. They can get drunk. The little farmers watch debt creep up on them like the tide. The orchard will be a part of a great holding next year. For the debt will have choked the owner. This vineyard will belong to the bank. Carloads of oranges dumped on the ground, a million hungry people needing the fruit, and kerosene sprayed over the golden mountains, and the smell of rot fills the country. Burn coffee for fuel in the ships, burn corn to keep warm, dump potatoes in the rivers, and place guards along the banks to keep the hungry people from fishing them out. Slaughter the pigs and bury them, and let the putrescence drip down into the earth. There is a crime here that goes beyond denunciation. There is a sorrow here that weeping cannot symbolize. There is a failure here that topples all success. In the eyes of the people, there is a failure. And in the eyes of the hungry, there is a growing wrath. In the souls of the people, the grapes of wrath are filling and growing heavy, growing heavy for the vintage. <coughs> Chapter 27. Cotton pickers wanted. Placards on the road, handbills out. Orange colored handbills. Here, up the road it says. The dark green plants stringy now. The heavy bowls clutched in the pod. White cotton spilling out like popcorn. I'm a good picker. Here's the man right here. I aim to pick some cotton. Got a bag? Well, no, I ain't. Cost you a dollar the bag. If you ain't got the buck, we'll take it out of your, your first 150. 80 cents a hundred first time over the field. That's fair and you know it. Sure it's fair. Good cotton bag. Last whole season. And when she's wore out, dragging, turn it around, use the other end. When both ends is gone, makes a nice pair of summer drawers, makes night shirts. And well, hell, a cotton bag's a good, it's a bag, it's a nice thing. Sack's full now. Take her to the scales. Are you? Scaleman says you got rocks to make weight. How about him? His scales is fixed. Sometimes he's right. You got rocks. Always argue, always fight. Keep your head up. Always argue. Hunch along now. They say a thousand men are on their way to this field. We'll be fighting for our row tomorrow. We'll be snatching cotton quick. Cotton pickers wanted. More men picking. Quicker to the gin. Side meat tonight by God. We got money for side meat. Stick out a hand to the little fella. He's wore out. Run on ahead and get four pounds of side meat. The old woman will make some nice biscuits tonight if she ain't too tired. <coughs> Chapter 29, The Flood. Over the high coast mountains and over the valleys, the gray clouds marched in from the sea. The wind blew fiercely and silently, high in the air, and swished in the brush and roared in the forests. The clouds came in brokenly, in puffs, in folds, in gray crags, and they piled in together and settled low over the west. And then the wind stopped and, the left, and left the clouds deep and solid. The rain began with gusty showers, pauses, and downpours, and then gradually it settled to a single tempo, small drops, and steady beat, rain that was gray to see through, rain that cut midday light to evening. And at first, the dry earth sucked the moisture down and blackened. For two days, the earth drank the rain until the earth was full. Then puddles formed. And in the low places, like in the low places, little lakes formed in the fields. A muddy lake rose higher, and the steady rain whipped the shining water. At last, the mountains were full, and the hillsides spilled into the streams, built them to freshets 
and sent them roaring down the canyons into the valleys. The rain beat on steadily, and the streams and the little rivers etched up the bank sides and worked at willows and tree roots, bent the willows deep in the current, cut out the roots of cottonwoods, and brought down the trees. The muddy water whirled along the bank sides. It crept up the banks until at last it spilled over into the fields, to the orchards, and to the cotton patches where the black stems stood. Level fields became lakes, broad and gray, and the rain whipped up the surfaces. Then the water poured over the highways, and cars moved slowly, cutting the water ahead and leaving a boiling, muddy wake behind. The earth whispered under the heat of the rain, and the streams thundered under the churning freshets. When the first rain started, the migrant people huddled in their tents, saying, it'll soon be over, and asking, how long is it likely to go on? And when the puddles formed, the men went out in the rain with shovels and built little dikes around the tents. The beating rain worked at the canvas until it penetrated and sent streams down. And then the little dikes washed out and the water came inside. And the streams wet the beds and the blankets. The people sat in wet clothes. They set up boxes and put planks on the boxes. Then, day and night, they sat on the planks. Beside the tents, the old cars stood, and water fouled the ignition wires, and water fouled the carburetors. The little gray tents stood in lakes, and at last the people had to move. Then the cars wouldn't start, because the wires were shorted, and if the engines would run, deep mud engulfed the wheels. And the people waded away, carrying their blankets in their arms. They splashed along, carrying the children, carrying the very old in their arms. And if a barn stood on high ground, it was filled with people shivering and hopeless. <clears throat> then some went to the relief offices, and they came sadly back to their own people. These rules. You gotta be here a year before you can get relief. They say the government is gonna help. They don't know when. And gradually the greatest terror of all came along. They ain't gonna be no kind of work for three months. In the barns, the people sat huddled together. The terror came over them. Their faces were gray with terror. The children cried with hunger and there was no food. <laughs> then the sickness came pneumonia and measles that went to the eyes and the mastoids. And the rain fell steadily and the water flowed over the highways for the culverts could not carry the water. Then from the tents, from the crowded barns, groups of sodden men went out, their clothes slopping rags, their shoes muddy pulp. They splashed out through the water to the towns, to the country stores, to the relief offices to beg for food, to cringe and beg for food, to beg for relief, to try to steal, and to lie. And under the begging and under the cringing, a hopeless anger began to smolder. And in the little towns, pity for the sodden men changed to anger. And anger at the hungry people changed to fear of them. Then sheriffs swore in deputies in droves, and orders were rushed for rifles, for tear gas, for ammunition. Then the hungry men crowded the alleys behind the stores to beg for bread, to beg for rotting vegetables, to steal when they could. Frantic men pounded on the doors of the doctors, and the doctors were busy. And sad men left word at country stores for the coroner to send a car. The coroners were not too busy. The coroner's wagons backed up through the mud and took out the dead. And the rain pattered relentlessly down, and the streams broke their banks and spread out over the country. Huddled under sheds, lying in wet hay, the hunger and the fear bred anger. The boys went out not to beg, but to steal. And men went out weakly to try to steal. The sheriff swore in new deputies and ordered new rifles. The comfortable people in tight houses felt pity at first, 
and then distaste, and finally hatred for the migrant people. If the, in the wet hay of leaking barns, babies were born to women who panted with pneumonia, and old people curled up in corners and died that way so that the coroners could not straighten them. At night, the frantic men walked boldly to hen roosts and carried off the squacking chickens. If they were shot at, they did not run, but splashed away sullenly. And if they were hit, they sank tiredly in the mud. The rain stopped. On the fields, the water stood reflecting the gray sky, and the land whispered with moving water. And the men came out of the barns, out of the sheds. They squatted on their hams and looked out over the flooded land. And they were silent. And sometimes they talked very quietly. No work till spring. No work. And if no work, no money, no food. Fella had a team of horses, had to use them to plow and cultivate and mow wouldn't think of turning them out to starve when they wasn't working. Them's horses. We're men. The women watched the men, watched to see whether the break had come at last. The women stood silently and watched, and where a number of men gathered together, the fear went from their faces and anger took its place. And the women sighed with relief for they knew it was all right. The break had not come, and the break would never come, as long as fear could turn to wrath. Tiny points of grass came through the earth, and in a few days, the hills were pale green with the beginning year.